If you have your Bibles, open with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll look at verse 11. Uh, I do guarantee you that at some point in my pastoral tenure, we will finish the book of Mark, but today will not be again that day. So we will get back on it at some point, but as we continue on back through this uh, reemergence into this building and facility, there's just some things that the Lord again has put on my heart. And one of those is this word encouragement, and the title of this morning is Keep Building Up. Keep Building Up. And we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, to lead us in this time. And if you have your Bibles, if you can turn along right there with me, it'll appear on the screens if that would be helpful as well. One verse that says so much and deeply impactful. Uh, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Let me say it again. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Let me pray over it. Lord, would you make it so? Would you continue to encourage us as we encourage others? Teach us, mold us, shape us more into your image today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing that you notice as a good student of God's word and been in the church for a long time, when you see the word therefore in the text, what should you do? You should always see what it's there for, right? As you're reading personally, individually, in your own quiet times, when you see the word therefore appear in scripture, you always wanna look and see what's come before it that would lead us to this place. So when you look at what comes before therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing, you see in chapter five, Paul is writing to the church uh, there about concerning the end times. He's saying, hey, the Lord's going to come like a thief in the night. Like just quickly, all of a sudden, the Lord is going to come back. Are you being sober-minded and are you prepared? Are you ready for the Lord to come back? Are you, are you ready to be prepared? And at times we, we maybe look for the signs, we look for the times to come, but the question is more than are you looking for the signs, are you ready for the Lord to come back or for the Lord to call you home? That's the greatly more important question. Are you prepared for the Lord to come back? And so with that, it's in light of that that we are led to verse 11. Now, let me, let me remind you how important that it is that we pick up on the context clues of Scripture. If I were to tell you today that six years ago I rushed to the hospital... Right? If, if I just gave you that line, six years ago I rushed to the hospital... Now, you may ask a lot of questions, right? What, what led you to the hospital? Are you okay now? Are you still having issues from six years ago? What, what led you to be there? Why did you have to rush, right? All those questions would be very natural and good questions. But if I quantified six years ago, I was rushed or I rushed to the hospital with six years ago, Brittany went into labor. So therefore we went and rushed to the hospital, right? It gives so much more clarity to that statement. Six years ago, we rushed to the hospital much more clear when you say, Brittany went into labor, therefore, six years ago, we went to the hospital, right? And so here, again, when we see, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up in light of the reality that Jesus is coming back, that Jesus will come like a thief in the night overnight, quickly, when we are not expecting it. And the question becomes, are we ready and are we encouraging one another for that day? All right. So that's a very important question that even this past week has come more into razor focus. This past week, we received a prayer card that's up here on the screen. I wanted you to see it. I posted it because I just was so taken by it. Uh, a, a child in our youth program, a young, a young in a student ministry, uh, simply turned in this prayer card that just said that all bad things to go away. It was such a beautiful prayer and one that I've kept right by my little desk on the computer because it's been such a profound reminder of what we often pray for pretty constantly. I mean, this prayer sums up most of my prayer life on behalf of our church, behalf of my own life. You're praying earnestly, Lord, would you take this cancer away? Would you take this terrible thing away? Lord, would you take this hardship away from this person? Lord, would you deliver this person out of this difficulty? At the end of the day, I'm praying, Lord, would you just take all the bad things away? Right? Have you often prayed that? Do you feel that in your own heart? At times just praying, Lord, just, just take all of these bad things away prayer request has just deeply touched my heart to be reminded that 
as we look back at 1 Thessalonians 5, we are looking forward to the day that Jesus will come back and make all things okay, to take away all the hard things, to take away all the bad things, to take away all the tears that we cry and the cancers that we endure. But until that day comes, until the Lord does deliver us from these hardships that we face, encouragement is a ministry that we are called to to continue on in this difficult, hard world that we live. And so let's look at some definitions that can help us this morning. First, what is encouragement? What is the biblical understanding of what encouragement is? Well, if you see it on your outline, encouragement is putting courage into a person. Encouragement is putting courage into a person. The biblical understanding of encouragement is not simple flattery. Encouragement is not to say, hey, I like your suit. Hey, your skirt is very nice. Or hey, Mark, your cowlick is probably staying down better than it's ever had today. Your, your encouragement is not simply calling attention to physical attributes that you like. Right? That, that's a good encouragement for people just to say nice things about somebody. But that's not the biblical understanding of what encouragement is. Encouragement is pouring courage into the heart of a weary soul. Encouragement is, putting, encouragement is putting courage into the soul that doesn't feel like they can take another step or walk another day. Encouragement is much greater, much heavier than just saying physically nice things and flattery over another person. Encouragement is a much weightier task that we experience. It's putting courage into the heart of a war-tossed saint. I've tried my hardest over these past two years as your pastor to be as open and honest and transparent as I can possibly be with you. I've tried to share my failures, my shortcomings, my, my struggles to remind you that I am far from a perfect man. So I've tried to be honest about where I've fallen short, try to be honest about the times in which I have failed, try to remind you of those situations and circumstances that I am struggling and you as a church, these past three years have really endured some difficult days. From COVID, to a pastoral transition, to a fire, to people running into our church with their car. I mean, just all sorts of stuff that's occurred this past three years. And you as a church have responded beautifully. And you have put courage into my soul. And this morning, I wanted to give you a visible representation of the courage that you have put into my soul. For the past two years as the pastor of this church, I have kept every card and letter that you have sent to me to encourage me. Two years. A box full of cards and notes and encouragement to bless my soul. I've only kept the good ones. Um, And they're here represented. I'm kidding, of course, but... For two years, on the days that I thought, you know, I just don't know that I can take another step. I am weary, I am exhausted, I'm tired. I don't think I can do this. Just cards, notes of affirmation and encouragement in scripture. An outpouring of love and support to my heart daily. I mean, it wouldn't be daily that you get a card or a note or a letter just saying, hey, I'm with you and I'm praying for you. I'm on your team, I got you, we're praying for you. God, God's with you, he hasn't forsaken you, he hasn't left you, he's with you. Keep going, keep pressing in. Just day after day after day, receiving card after card, letter after letter. This is the kind of church that we are. A church that when we're down, when we're struggling, you just pour out your affirmation, your encouragement constantly onto a weary soul. Day after day when I felt like I don't know that I can take another step. A day after day where I feel like, Lord, what else can happen around here? Day after day where you feel like, Lord, what in the world is happening? You poured your courage into me. Some of them were kids just writing notes saying, Pastor Mark, we're with you. Mark, we love you. We're praying for you. Over and over and over just to receive card after card after card after card, letter and note after note after note after note, just saying, we are on your team. Now, I don't pour all these out here just to say, hey, this is great. Y'all keep it up. I'm reminding you who you are as a church. 
You put courage into the hearts of weary brothers and sisters. When men and women don't think they can take another step in parenthood, you continue to put courage into the hearts of believers. On those days that you are weary and don't think you can take another step, you encourage brothers and sisters. These things are not, hey, Mark, your, your suit looked good on Sunday. Hey, you, you really, you had a nice tie. I really appreciate it. These are God's words spoken back, scripture written, prayers prayed to encourage a weary soul. And so for that, I want to say thank you. For that, I want to say keep lifting one another up. Keep encouraging one another just as you are doing. Our world is a weary world full of discouragement and dismay. But as you encourage one another, you build up a weary soul. When the kids don't sleep well and you walk up to church and you're frustrated and tired. I cannot tell you how many times I've picked up a card and just began to read that encouragement from a brother or sister who just wanted to pour out their heart in affirmation. What does that do but put courage into the soul? So with that, I want to remind you what your calling is, the weightier responsibility, not just to send flattery through the mail, not just to send flattery through your words, is to build up a people who are weary and tired and broken and hurting. So if encouragement is then putting courage into someone, what would then discouragement be? Discouragement is taking the courage out of someone. Discouragement is not simply saying your calic is off today or your suit is ugly. Your, your discouragement is not simply talking negatively about somebody. It's actually taking the courage out of someone who's called to live on mission for the Lord. So again, you feel that these are weightier terms, not just simple flattery. These are weighty terms that we would put courage into a weary soul. In discouragement, God forbid, we would take the courage out of a weary soul. And so we do that as we encourage and build one another up. And the language that Paul uses reminds us, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing the reminder that we are with one another, that we exist in community with one another. The old adage we say around here a lot, we need Jesus and we need each other, means that we exist around one another to encourage each other as we walk through life's challenges. Meaning we need to know what's going on. We need to walk with each other through life's ups and downs. We need to confess those areas that we need help in. We need to walk with brothers and sisters together through whatever life would bring to us. Because the reality is, you need courage when you're weary, exhausted, and don't feel like you can keep going. You're going to need courage when you you're walking with the Lord and taking a next right step of obedience. You're going to need the Lord's courage in your soul when you're walking with the Lord to take the next right step of obedience. You're going to need courage when you're confessing your sin to another brother or sister. You're going to need courage when you're sharing your faith with an unbeliever. You're going to need courage when you're in an environment that is hostile to the gospel. You're going to need courage when you're facing a cancer diagnosis. When you're walking through grief, when you faced a miscarriage, when the storms of life seem to be all around you, you're going to need the Lord's courage. And you need the brothers and sisters in the faith to pour God's courage into your souls. I've never met a person who has tapped out on encouragement. I've never met a person that said, I don't need another note of encouragement. I don't need any more encouragement. I finally reached my maximum. We always need more. And so let me ask you this question, then how do we encourage? What does it look like for us as individuals to encourage other people? Let's look at four different places. As you leave today, you can be resolute that I'm going to be an encourager. First and foremost, by your words. How do you encourage? First, by your words. Ephesians 4.29 tells us, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. I hope that that verse uh, reminds your soul of our scripture memory. Let no corrupting talk, but only such as good for building up. Here in Ephesians 4.29 and 1 Thessalonians, you see these words used, building up. 
language, that our calling is to build one another up. In our household, we, we play with a lot of blocks, a lot of blocks. Micah, as a six-year-old, has gotten very adept and astute at building these very tall towers along with his sister, and they can build, as a four-year-old and a six-year-old, they can build pretty impressive towers, I'm not going to lie, with Legos or with wooden blocks. I mean, he's gotten to that age where he's, he's wise about building a foundation and then can stack blocks beautifully on top of each other and build these incredible structures. He's gotten pretty good over time. As he's matured, his dexterity and his ability to build a foundation and a base has gotten better and better as he has matured to build up these incredible towers. His two-year-old sister has not become as good. She's gotten mighty good at tearing down those towers, right? Where Micah spends time and Helen Ann spend time building up the towers, his sister has become good at just going this action, this activity, right? Just knocking everything in sight down. And it's almost like she can sense with her eyes when a tower is being built and knows when does she need the flail and arm type situation to knock down those towers. And as I've watched this take place, it's reminded me of encouragement that as Micah and Helen Ann, as mature four and five, six year olds, are able to build up these beautiful towers, that those who are mature in their faith also have a similar calling. The more mature we are with our faith, the more that we desire to build people up. It's in our hearts, it's in our souls. As we, as we grow in depth of faith, we desire to build up the body of Christ and we long to build people up. We wanna find ways to encourage other people. And our goal as we mature in our faith is to do precisely that, to build people up block by block, angle by angle, a much more difficult task. But I've also found those who are less mature in their faith seem to me more called or have a propensity towards not building up, but just knocking down. Looking for opportunities not to build up, even if it's not good, but just to tear, tear people apart. And we see with our words, we have the power of life and the power of death in our words. And so when scripture would say, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. First and foremost, you encourage others by your words. Are you building people up? Are you building them up and putting courage into them with your words? Are you tearing people apart with your words? Secondly, we encourage by our testimony. We encourage others by our testimony. This morning, as we heard Carrie's testimony of faith and Carrie and Mike share about God's goodness to them, was your heart not encouraged? You listen to that testimony and hear Carrie sing, is your heart not spurred towards encouragement to, walk, to watch as Carrie sing her testimony, to see as Carrie presented herself and just said, Lord, thank you for the goodness of who you are. Is your heart not filled with encouragement? And as we share the testimony of what God has done, it fills our hearts with encouragement. Let me give you a word to say to your brothers and sisters. At times when you're in Bible fellowship, when you're in small groups, ask somebody, what has God been teaching you lately? And then let them talk. What has God been teaching you lately? And listen as they share God's testimony of what God has been teaching them and showing them in their lives. There's something beautiful about the testimony of faith. Romans 1.12 says, that is that we both be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Our testimonies of God's faithfulness put more faith and courage into our hearts. Number three, by our words, by our testimony, and by your presence. Your simple presence alongside a hurting brother or sister goes deep to encourage their souls. Ecclesiastes reminds us two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Reminded uh, of these past couple weeks as we've had some power outages at the house and I remember those days of the power going out at the house and sitting around as mom and dad would light a candle and we'd play board games and this scary situation all of a sudden turned into this fun evening of no light, no electricity, but we're playing board games around the family table and we're, you know, just playing and having a good time. I also recall a time that mom and dad had just left to go to the grocery store and left me home alone with the 
thunder and lightning outside and all of a sudden power goes out and all of a sudden home alone with no power, everything gets a little bit different. There's no candle, there's no board games, there's just fear. Home by yourself, the thunder's raging outside, there's no light on in the house and all of a sudden with no presence of the parents in the home, my little heart was beating fast. And it's amazing, as soon as they walked in the door and opened the door, even though the power was not back on, even though the storm had not stopped at all, even their presence calmed my fear and filled my heart with courage. The same is true as we walk through whatever it is the Lord leads us to. It's amazing what the presence of God's people alongside a hurting brother or sister does for the soul. Standing beside a hospital bed, standing behind a hospice bed, standing next to someone taking cancer treatments, it's amazing what the power of our presence does for a hurting soul. Never underestimate your presence next to a brother or sister, just your arm around them to encourage them. So by your words, by your testimony, by your presence, and lastly, by God's truth. We give and put courage into another soul by God's truth. Romans 15, 4 reminds us whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. This morning, what's written on most of these cards is just simply scripture. It's simply reminding me of God's transforming truth over and over and over and over again. I remind you of your encouragement that would come through God's truth, pointing people constantly to God's truth. As we conclude this morning, let me just give you a final word. As we leave this place, this is a practical sermon, a practical thing that you can, you can develop and deploy today. So pray and deploy the treasure of encouragement into others today. My desire for us as we leave this place is that we would deploy the absolute treasure of encouragement into other people's hearts today. As we leave this place, as you go, who can you encourage? Who can you build up in your life around you? Who needs the courage of the Lord put into their hearts through your presence, through your words, and through your testimony of God's grace? So pray and generously deploy the treasure of encouragement into others. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this joy-filled opportunity to come together. And we thank you for the way that you have demonstrated yourself to us. Lord, I pray that you would continue working here in our midst, that our church would be known as a place that lifts up the name of Jesus and fills weary hearts full of courage to face the day. Lord, thank you for what's been done here in the past. Thank you for the courage that's been put in hearts all over this sanctuary and this congregation for years and years and years. And thank you for the courage that we leave this place with as we go. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.